Okay, so the, uh, the third and final talk of this first session, before we move on to the Jenkins lecture later, uh, will be given by uh, Professor Tim Dennison on brain engineering, rewiring the diseased nervous system for improved health. Now, Professor Dennison holds a joint appointment in this department of engineering science and in clinical neurosciences here in Oxford, where he explores fundamentals of physiologic closed loop systems. Prior to being in Oxford, Tim was a technical fellow at Medtronic PLC and vice president of research and core technology for the Restorative Therapies Group, where he helped oversee the design of next generation neural interface and algorithm technologies for the treatment of chronic neurological disease. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Tim now for, for his talk. Thank you, Martin. So it's my pleasure to give an overview of some of the research going on within the team at uh, the University of Oxford with many collaborators, and I actually want to start with them. It's an international group, multiple disciplines, and what I also want to highlight in red is that we're also teaming already with industry on translation of this technology, specifically with Bioinduction Limited. We have a collaboration to both develop research tools, and I'll talk about those, and how we're exploring getting new therapies onto the NHS. So to give you some context is the journey we're going to go on over the next 15 minutes or so is to think about taking technology, similar to many science fiction concepts, shrink it down, put it into the nervous system of an individual with a disease, and as engineers and clinicians, think about what we can do in order to restore health. So while it might be considered science fiction in some cases, I'm gonna bring up and kind of go through the journey of developing this brain implant, which we developed with Alex Green in neurosurgery and bioinduction and how we're exploring the treatment of neurological diseases with this. Let's start out with why this is an important problem. Yeah. So, and also why think about electricity. This is a snapshot of the burden and opportunity of brain disorders just in the EU alone. And so the top row represents the number of people suffering on the orders of millions to tens of millions per year. The middle row is the aggregate economic cost for one of those individuals. And of course, the final row is the net product. And so we can see these disease states are actually costing economically on the order of hundreds of billions of euros per year, not to mention, of course, the personal and family costs. So we're making progress in the areas of Parkinson's and epilepsy devices. But what we want to do is think about how we can make these devices more effective and also how we might be able to expand into other areas that are even representing burdens an order of magnitude greater. First thing that might come to mind as an engineer is why not pharma? Why not just looking to pharmaceuticals? Well, pharma has been struggling of late. This is a review in nature discovery, thinking about the efficiency of how, much it you know, how many drugs are released for every billion dollars of US investment. So note that the y-axis is actually logarithmic and the x-axis in time is linear. And you can see there's a drop off as a straight line. And they've actually dubbed this as Eroom's Law, which is a little hint on the arrow, is Moore's Law spelled backwards. And so you know, this is to contrast the evolution of you know, semiconductors and the integration we've been able to see over the last several decades. And for the students, I kind of take a chip um, from my friends at IMEC, and uh, this is the year I was born, and this is how it has scaled down, kind of applying Moore's Law as technologies have improved. And we note 2014, they stopped, and that's not because the, uh, there was no more innovation, it's because it would no longer fit on a pixel on the screen. And so we start to think about the practical application. Have we seen this uh, at, you know, actually in technology and medicine? And of course we have. The cardiac pacemaker is an excellent example of this, where in the late 50s, Earl Bakken, the founder of the company I worked with, built the first transistorized pacemaker, modifying a metronome circuit for music and turning it into the world's first battery-powered pacemaker. And then riding the technology curve of materials, energy sources, and of course, semiconductors, we've been able to evolve that to today, where basically a 10-year cardiac pacemaker is about the size of your pinky finger and is placed um, through a venous access through your leg. Now, in addition, it's not just the circuitry, it's also thinking about the entire ecosystem of what's involved to make a successful device. And that's something I want to reinforce, especially for those of you who are through the B2 sequence um, at engineering science, 
it's not just that we had a clinical necessity and the science worked and we could build a circuit. We also have to think very carefully about the economics, the workflow of our clinicians and how they can actually deploy this technology and also the regulatory pathway. And so this is something within our team we're constantly thinking about developing the new technologies to make sure we're taking all of these considerations um, into account. So where are we today with brain implants? As I was saying, Parkinson's disease and tremor is the most successful in my space. This is a gentleman with intention tremor. He has a brain device in his head. On the left, the device is actually turned off. You can see his baseline tremor on, on the right, his device is turned on. And on average in blinded studies, you see about a 30% improvement, oftentimes up to a 50% improvement in essential tremor. But we can see there's still resi residual side effects and we're limited in what we can do in that we have, um, if we keep, just keep turning up the electricity, turning up the amplitude, we'll actually start to create additional side effects such as speech defects and the feeling of tingling, paresthesia, um, which are undesirable. So there's still work to be done both within the established therapies, but also thinking about expanding them outwards. But how did we even get to the, the, uh, the implant that I just demonstrated? That was really relying on a reuse of technology. So this is an X-ray from a subject with a DBS stimulator, where the, basically a cardiac pacemaker-like device is implanted in the chest, and instead of the wires routing into the heart, they're routed, out, routed into electrodes that are placed by a neurosurgeon deep into a brain target. Now this was mentally replacing a, a technique where they would do an RF lesion, so basically destroy the brain circuit. And so they said, called us the electricity pulses that we were providing a reversible lesion. And the issue with that is that it really anchored the mindset of how people were developing technology. Lesions are static. So they were thinking very static about just turning a device on, having it running the same way 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So currently what's happening in the field is this shift of mindset and going from RF lesions and a static mindset to really thinking about the devices we build as essentially a brain coprocessor. So not just providing actuation through a stimulation circuit like the cardiac pacemaker, but also thinking about the signals that we might be able to read out from the nervous system, other physiological inputs, process those in a feedback loop, recognize patterns in classifying the patient state, and then use that to adjust the stimulator again in real time. And of course, we are consistently learning. We want to basically explore the neuroscience and say what is working, what is not working, and use that as an additional pathway for innovation. And to make sure I don't lose anybody, uh, so stepping back, essentially you can think of the classical, that first generation of device as a boiler, but with no control. It was kind of fixed at a certain BTU output, didn't matter what the weather was, didn't matter if the windows were open. And what we're looking for are those analogs of measuring sens uh, sensor input, such as temperature, and then using that to con uh, control the device so we get more of a real-time optimized physiological output from the device. So at Oxford, um, especially the MRC Brain Network Dynamic Unit, there's been a lot of um, pioneering work in this space. And so that analog, if you will, of temperature is measuring the signals off of those implanted leads and looking at the signatures, specifically the baseline rhythms in the brain. So you could think about this as the amplitude, kind of the spectral energy at a specific frequency, very much like an AM radio, if you will. And so what was observed in the early 2000s was that when Parkinson's patients were off their medication, they would actually have a strong tone around 20 hertz when they were symptomatic, and then when they responded to medication, that tone would go down. So that gives us a hint of kind of a, a physiological variable we can measure, the frequency domain. And then Peter Brown, the founder of our unit, replicated that, but using electrical stimulation, where he could measure the frequency at that beta rhythm, in this case, about 10 hertz in this patient. And as he stepped up stimulation and saw a critical value where symptoms were relieved, that beta band was suppressed. And so it's a very simple concept for a closed loop algorithm, and we can connect those dots and put them together um, and kind of build up a reactive responsive loop 
that adjust both to the symptoms that the patient's showing in real time, but also changes that might be induced by medication state. Ah, but we come back to all the things to consider. Peter's experiments were limited to a certain amount of time when basically the electrodes were released and outside of the patient's brain prior to the implant going in. That's what gave him access to measure these signals. So we had hints of scientific validity, but the technical maturity, our ability to measure those microvolt RMS signals was still a challenge. And thinking about the workflow of how a clinician was actually gonna be able to configure the algorithm were all wide open questions. One in particular, which is quite intriguing, is that the, because those leads were um, externalized, and because we were also limited at the time at the John Radcliffe Hospital, we were basically measuring between noon and kind of mid-afternoon tea time. So we had a little snapshot of a 24-hour window. And what we realize now is that as people sleep, of course, these rhythms are changing, and that can actually throw off the algorithm. So we were limit, really limited by having large equipment in the lab, a very limited time window in order to evaluate patients, and we needed to do something about it. And so this is where we come back to that analog of a fantastic voyage, where we had to take all of that instrumentation in the EFIS laboratory at the hospital and shrink it down into a device that could fit into a patient and then allow us to provide 24 seven physiology and prototype algorithms with our clinician partners. So this is the uh, collaboration, as I say, it's, uh, it can be challenging as academics to go out and build an implantable class three high risk medical device. And so that's sometimes best done in collaboration with an industry partner and that's bioinduction. They're the only um, certified manufacturer of active medical devices currently in the UK. And they have a baseline device which sits in the cranium in a little pocket and we can place electrodes then deep into different brain targets. What we've worked with them and with other academic collaborators over the last four years is building what we call the Dynamo research system. And so this provides sensors, wakes up sensors such as accelerometers, can measure bioelectrical signals in the presence of stimulation, as well as explore circadian patterns and other rhythms. And then through an algorithm toolbox, we can both measure that physiology as well as prototype closed loop algorithms. So getting away from that static constant stimulation to something that's dynamically adjusting based on physiology and the patient's needs. So the disappointment, and uh, probably many of you online went through COVID and some of its challenges, I'd imagine. Right when we were getting our toolbox ready, the JR was shut down. So all clinical trials put on hold so we stepped back and worked with veterinarians, uh, particularly uh, Holger Volk at Hanover, who had just uh, transferred from the Royal Vet. And dogs end up having epilepsy at the same uh, prevalence as humans. And there's actually very similar characteristics. And so the vet hospitals were still open and using the medicinals law in Germany, Holger explored experimental medicine and we put the prototype device of the dynamo with the electrodes into the central median thalamus to treat a dog who had severe status epilepticus. So basically would have seizures, require general anesthesia in order to wake the dog back up. And so the other option was um, to euthanize the dog and instead the owner opted in for putting in a dynamo. And so we wrote up this case report after implantation we ceased all status epilepticus events for the remainder of the dog's life, uh, which was over 18 months. And then in addition to that, we uh, significantly suppressed the cluster seizures and the requirement for um, interventions. Another opportunity that presented itself during uh, COVID was to still get emergency exemptions. And so with the MHRA, they would allow us to use the Dynamo as an electrophysiology toolkit and so this is a case at St. George's in London where a patient who had a existing DBS device, they could not actually uh, get her therapy to work for cervical dystonia, which is kind of a, a uh, severe uh, spasming of the muscles, if you will, in your neck. And so we were able to externalize access to the leads for about a week 
and then used the Dynamo prototype for the clinicians to understand what was going on and eventually get her therapy under control. But now in 2022, we're able to reinitiate our work at uh, Oxford and with our collaborators and start the human trials. We have a ongoing trial. This is the, uh, called the MINDS, Motion Adaptive Deep Brain Stimulation for Multiple System Atrophy. This gives you a snapshot um, just after lunch. So the, uh, the stereotactic leads are placed uh, by Alex Green up at the JR into a specific target. This is actually a skin flap, and you can see the Dynamo, P the PicoStim chassis with the Dynamo instruments is slipped into the cranium. This actually gives you a sense, though, um, the subject naturally had hair loss uh, caused by the device, that two months afterwards, it's actually hard to see that there's actually a device there. So everything does heal up fairly well. This is a CT to give you a sense of the device placement and how the leads are then placed into the upper brainstem. So we're currently um, evaluating two subjects and enrolling the last three. And that's our preliminary efficacy work. And this is then unrolling a full roadmap of new therapies that we're looking to innovate with, specifically looking at the quality of life adjusted years per pound so that we can get new therapies onto the National Health Service list. So within the Oxford community, we're looking at disorders of consciousness that arise from traumatic brain injury. And that's putting the lead in to the upper brain stem and servoing based on physiological markers. And with the same concept going in to look at uh, post-stroke subjects with chronic pain and getting the device and therapies back on the list. In partnership with the London hospitals, especially pediatric hospitals, we've also worked for the last few years to refine the device specifically for children down to the age of five. And we're currently have the device in review at MHR for the cadet study looking at Linux gasto generalized epilepsy. So just to wrap up, I want to remind us we have a major societal burden with neurological disorders. We're just starting to make inroads in the areas of Parkinson's disease and epilepsy. But we've hit hurdles both in terms of the clinical neuroscience and some of the translation. Taking a page from what someone might call science fiction, but our opportunity to shrink technologies down, get them into the nervous system and do chronic clinical neuroscience and prototyping with devices such as the Pico Stim Dynamo. We're now starting to expand and improve on these baseline therapies of Parkinson's and epilepsy. And then also with our international partners and other university partners start to push and look at the opportunities across a much broader neurological spectrum. Thank you.